My name is Niels and I'm the founder of Zenbot, which is a chatbot to help you discover the purpose of your life. <coughs> now, what's the problem that we're talking about here? So roughly 80% of young adults, so 20, uh, 14 to 22 year olds, cannot describe with any accuracy what it is that they are to accomplish in life, i.e. what their purpose is. Um, this leads to a whole host, was linked to a whole host of physical and mental health problems such as um, cardiovascular disease. Um, unfortunately, it also leads to increased suicide risk and um, lower propensity to engage in uh, positive well-being measures. Um, now, this is a bit scary, but 50% of mental health problems are actually developed before the age of 14 and 75 before the age of 24. And this is the st saddest statistic. 70% of children and adolescents who experience mental health problems not had appropriate interventions at sufficient age. And this is in a country, this, these are UK stats, this is in a country where we have free mental health care. So what the hell is going on? Why are people not taking advantage of these services that um, are being offered to them. So, my belief is that a chatbot, which, sorry, yeah. So then it's a chatbot that helps people discover their purpose and holds them accountable to living their best <coughs> life. And one of the reasons that I believe why people are not engaging in these free services is because it's, it's very hard to self-diagnose a mental health problem and then actually be in a state of mind to reach out because let's face it if you're depressed the very last thing that you want to do is talk to a stranger about your problems and therefore i believe this is actually a good application but this is my why do you why do i care so this used to be me totally different career i used to be a fruit trader and uh, I ambitiously set out to create the Alibaba of the fruit trading world, which was hopelessly ambitious for the small amount of money that I had to do this with. And um, I failed. And it sucked. As much as Silicon Valley fetishizes failure, it really hurts when you have to pick yourself up and have another crack. And I was at a point where I really didn't know where to, why to get up in the morning. But I was amazed how using very consumer-grade technologies such as Headspace Meditation app and the five-minute journal, which is a pre-formatted journal that asks you three questions in the morning and three questions in the evening. I was just surprised at how quickly I managed to bounce back using these tools. We're talking weeks, not months here. And I really got a completely different outlook on life by just self-reflecting on what was going on and taking stock of what was good about my life when all I could see what was bad. And that's when the kernel of the idea started to develop in my mind, to develop a coaching chatbot. And I've since then become a coach myself. I now work for a company called Landmark Worldwide, and I train their coaches on the self-expression leadership course. And this is, this is something that's really changed my life, and I recommend everybody has some kind of a coaching relationship, either supplying coaching or receiving coaching. But since this is a chatbot meetup, let's take a step back and see why this is a appropriate use case for a chatbot. So, especially for young adults, let's face it, they actually engage more in text conversations than they do in voice conversations on the phone or in person. So meet them at where they, where they already are instead of trying to drag them into a therapy room or into a coaching relationship. and. In the UK, the coach starts somewhere at 50 pounds an hour, so it's not really available to young adults. Um, this is interesting, so people tend to be more open when they're talking to a computer system, and this is, a, this is not my stat, this comes from a company called Daiso, who I'll be talking to about a little bit more later. Um, and they discovered that when people talk to computer-based systems, they are less concerned with how what they're saying is landing with the other person. They're not processing the nonverbal communication that's coming across. So it's 
yeah, it tends to help people self-reflect in a more honest way. And as a coach, I can tell you, it's really difficult to chase your coaches and get them to have integrity around what they said that they were going to do and automating that process, checking in with them and having them do the update is, it's actually, it's actually quite a good system. And finally, it's adaptive to user input. So, not like um, other apps where you have to um, kind of force as many users down the same funnel. This is more adaptive and can be flexible based on what the, part, what the person wants to bring to the session, what they want to talk about. And yeah, that's, again, it's what best done in chatbot. So I'm not going to do a demo because demos never work. And um, therefore, I'm just going to give you sort of a high level overview of what the onboarding process in the first couple of weeks looked like. So at the very beginning, we tried to understand where a person currently is at in life and what, they, what level of contentment they're at. Are they actually working towards what they want to be doing? Is what they're doing making them happy? Um, Based on how often they want to check in, then we dive deeper into their unique strengths to build on and identify their unique personal development areas. And by the end of week one, we reflect back on what they've actually shared and give them a give them a way of seeing themselves that they've probably never had because we're just biased towards looking at what's bad in our life, what's negative, rather than to give ourselves credit for what we're actually doing. And with anything that's vaguely related to personal well-being or mental health, you're not going to get quick wins. So these are lengthy processes. And I'm sure we've all read Hooked, which talks about getting people to have a very that magic first user experience that will then have people flying through the habit loop but it's a lot harder to do with mental health plays. So what we do is we try to give them a, a roadmap for a perfect day. That's something that they can implement immediately. And it's aspirational because most people don't think about what is it that actually constitutes me in the most er important areas of well-being. And in the second week, we start getting more into goal setting and uh, yeah, ongoing reporting on what people are doing and what they're not doing. So this is, so I, can't, I don't know if you can actually see this, but um, we're also working on a second product in parallel. It's, a, it's based on a psychological paradigm, which is called acceptance and commitment therapy, it, or ACT for short. And um, I've, I've studied various psychological pro, uh, paradigms and this is kind of an evolution of cognitive behavioral therapy which is quite popular nowadays but where cognitive behavioral therapy gets people to engage with individual thoughts on an individual basis to try and lessen their severity or, or lessen the frequency with which they occur acceptance and commitment therapy it has you accept that you will have negative thoughts in your life, and that's okay. But your res the response that you have to those thoughts is something that you can influence. And as the name implies, ACT is all about getting into action regardless and not being stopped by down cycles. And so this is something that we're, we're now developing um, in partnership with, a, with University College of Dublin as a exam preparation board to help um, students lessen their anxiety and anticipation of exams. And yeah, we will be, so this, this is kind of where we're at at the moment. So mid-2018, we are currently Facebook Messenger only. Um, we've got a a basic alpha version of the bot running. Um, we will be launching a uh, native app shortly because probably don't have to tell this room, but bot discovery is definitely not solved and trying to explain to people that they have to download one application so that they can talk to our application just blows most people's minds. 
So that's why we're just sending them to the App Store and saying, this is, this is a tried and tested way. So in September, we're looking at opening up our beta. And the exam trial that I was talking of is going to kick off in October. And on the 1st of January next year, we want to have a proper, um, proper release. And yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the tech stack that we're using. And yeah, Pandora Bots is on there. <laughs> Um, I didn't actually know that they were going to be presented, but hey. So, let me walk you through this. So, does this thing... I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, never mind. Okay, so this is the user, and at a high level they interface with... Um, the front end is Facebook Messenger, as mentioned. Now, Hippocamp is a custom-built uh, messenger engine, which quite a few people in the room have actually worked on developing Hippocamp. And um, so, yeah, it's a London-based technology that um, I'm very happy to be using as a development client. So, the messages go through Facebook Messenger into the Hippocamp engine. We then at um, we interface at Zen with it, and we, we're essentially we're looking whether the input matches the expectation. So if we ask for a date and they try to put in emojis, then yeah, okay, we'll bounce that back. Um, but we beyond that, we can't really understand what people are doing. So that's why we use Raza to, um, which is a it's a natural language understanding tool that is open source, and they, I don't know how many presentations you've had for Raza. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they're really cool. And they're open source, which was important to us because we're talking about people's mental health and very personal issues here, so we didn't really feel comfortable sending that to some server on the west coast of the States. And um, so we we essentially we script the conversations in Zen, and if somebody leaves that scripted conversation and tries to tries to traverse the, the tree instead of the decision tree, instead of going up and down it as, as the designer expected. That's where Raza comes in because it then can try and match what the user is trying to do to an action within the system. And yeah, we use it to, to train that, um, that kind of behavior. If we can't figure out what people are actually trying to do, we ping it to Pandora, um, which is as we heard just now, it's kind of the old school way of doing AI, and it, it works actually quite well. And it was it was through this meetup that I heard about Pandora and Steve Zwartzig and his bot. And yeah, they have a very cool API that takes users' input and fires something back. It might not make much sense, but it's still better than having people hit that catch all where it says, "Oh, sorry, I couldn't understand." What, you, what you're trying to say to me, which um, it's kind of what I want to know. So yeah, here's the, this, is what I, this is what happened after we installed um, Pandora. So we had a retention problem, like I think every, I mean every bot has a retention problem. It's, it's still a lot lower than apps. And, uh, but what we realized was that people that in their first session managed to hit that, sorry, don't know what you're talking about, type catch-all, we wouldn't, it was very unlikely that we would ever see them again. So, and I actually found some statistics around this. If you're, if you're retaining more than 7% of your users beyond the first month, you're actually doing better than most bots that are being monitored by bot analytics, which is a bit sad. Um, so, proud to say, we were actually above that, but that was probably because we've got, we, we're still an alpha, so it's still a small sample size, and people know me and other people on the team, so that's, that's probably why we've got a slightly higher than normal retention. But what was interesting was after we implemented Pandora, we almost hit 25% um, re retention, which, yeah, it's, it's not fantastic, but it's still a far cry better than what we were doing before that. Um, so yeah, I can talk a little bit about the competitors. Um, so, AISO is a, they're a 
online cognitive behavioral therapy service that um, you can get on the NHS, so they are clinically validated. These guys are, they've been doing this for 10 years and they've got a very strong data science first approach. So you're still talking to someone at the other end. Someone is actually typing into the keyboard, but you know, who knows how much of what they are sending back to the, um, the patient is actually machine-derived or human-derived. So, yeah, very interesting what they're doing. Um, Wobo, also someone, Alison Darcy has spoken by, uh, at this meetup. But Wobo is a CBT bot that is post-diagnostic. In other words, you have to have identified that you've got a mental health issue to get any value out of talking to a robot. If, you, if you're kind of doing okay and you're trying to have a conversation with a robot, robot will, it, it kind of quickly becomes nonsensical when you say, when it asks you, how are you doing? And I say, well, actually, I'm doing pretty damn well. And it's like, oh, do you need to talk to someone about that? It's like, no, actually, no. <laughs> you don't, you're not getting me here. I'm, I'm good, you know? <laughs> So it's, it's really just for that one specific use case. It's not a coaching bot. It, and that's, that's kind of where, um, so this smiley face down here, that's a act specific app. It's not a chat bot, um, but it is, it kind of dances that line between a coaching and a therapy bot, but it has no clinical validation and therefore you wouldn't be able to use it um, it, it's not, it does not replace a human as AISA does and um, sort of my aspiration is that one day we'll kind of be sitting between these two. I see Zen as something like a, call it a smoke alarm that shows when somebody is going from being okay to a mood disorder that's when you want to try and catch them and try and get them back to baseline before that mood disorder turns into a full-blown mental health issue. That's, that's doable. What's really, really tough is to have people that are three, four years into a mental health problem when and try and get them back through talking therapy without the use of drugs or you know, before they turn into a psychotic patients. So that's kind of where we see it. And um, yeah, the moonshot. For us, it's really so. At the moment, what we're doing is we are taking actively collected data that people enter into the bot. But the first thing that people who are slipping into a depressive cycle um, do is they stop. They stop reaching out. They stop engaging in well-being measures. So yes, we can we can predict to some degree that somebody is slipping into a mental health pattern, but. We can't actually, at the moment, tell whether they're just on holiday and they had, they had a very stressful time in the week leading up to the holiday. But what we want to do is we want to cross-correlate the actively collected data with passively collected mobile phone sensor data that will show us that people, for example, people's GPS signals are um, they're just on the same route all the time. Actually, they're not even leaving their apartments. There's nothing, um, there's nobody being added to their phone book. And th before you, before you scream, scream privacy at me, yes, there are ways of doing this that retain data integrity. It doesn't have to leave the device um, for us to be able to see a change in the pattern. So yeah, that's kind of where we're going with this. And um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, really interesting work. Um, so I have some friends um, in Brighton who've been through the landmark process. Um, would you mind telling people who don't know a little bit about it, and then also maybe just qualify like what you've learned in your coaching and then what what you brought to bear in in the bot? I think that'd be interesting to learn. Yeah. About. So landmark is it's quite a it's slightly controversial, um, and it's. It's a three-week, it's a three-day weekend, and it's 
very confrontational. So you get sat down in a room with about 150 people. It counts as a large scale awareness training. So you have a person on the on stage leading the program, and they in the first in the first uh, weekend, the it can be summed up as there's a voice in your head, and you have an option to listen to it or not listen to it. And you might think right now, what the hell is this guy talking about? But this is the voice for a little bit longer. Yeah, it's that voice that told you. Yeah, that guy's full of shit. And um, that self-dialogue that's always going on, that's essentially what the first weekend is trying to get you aware of. And the second weekend then asks the fundamental question, who am I and what is my life for? And that um, leads on into the program that I currently coach on, which is taking that awareness and seeing how the way that you interact in the world can start influencing other people in a positive way and it's a more ongoing process and the thing that I, 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 I gain massively from doing Landmark and uh, but the, and, I, and I always, when I went into it I thought okay I'm just going to do this to kind of cherry pick the best things for, for Zen but uh, what I realized was it's it's, it's a very mishmash of different approaches and it's not scientifically validated, so it's, it's going to be very hard to sell it as a, as a landmark bot. But what I realized was that acceptance and commitment therapy actually covers a lot of the bases, but it has more than 2,000 uh, um, peer-reviewed studies that do back it up. So yeah, that, that kind of was, that was the missing piece that brought it all together. Shut up. Um, interested in the initial outreach as well as, as far as Zen is concerned. How do you access these clients at the first point? What's your what's your target? How do you target them? How do you identify them and find them in categories or whatever? Yeah, so we're we're in quite advanced talks with several universities and um, one London borough who have got a mental health program in schools and so the project with the London borough is that they're going to be sending 40 counsellors into schools um, that are going to be available for people to talk to who want to talk but we feel that offering this on top of that counselling service is going to service people who might not one might feel that talking to a counsellor is not quite yet, yeah, they're not at that stage yet, but they don't really, don't really have a base for comparison. So, we initially we started just by um, trying to drive a consumer first strategy, and uh, we, we found that, well, we weren't, we weren't getting enough traction on that, so now we're looking at more, um, we're looking at more partnerships with existing um, organizations that will give us access to their clients. So it's sort of a B2B to, B to C pro, uh, model that we're driving here. Thank you. Given that uh, most bots are a work in progress, that you continue to refine the conversational dynamics of the bot. What does it in practice mean to have a bot scientifically validated as being therapeutic in mental health? What does that entail? So, we're essentially at University College Dublin. We are running this as a trial. So my co-founder, um, he teaches a class at, at UCD and we're, we're going to run a, a, a split test where some people get the bot, um, some people they get a mental health handbook and we don't know whether this is going to work yet but um, it's going to hopefully, my, well my, my hypothesis is that 
um, people filling out the GAD7 score, which is the General Anxiety Disorder score, or the PHQ-9 Depression Rating Scale, um, which are built into the specific bot journey, that they will be less um, anxious and less depressed at the end of the eight-week intervention than the control group. And as an added bonus, if we could, if we could show that um, people actually have, um, they, they actually got better grades from using the bot, that would be, that would be a knockout um, success. So yeah, work in progress, but I hope that answers. I was curious about your, um, how you chose your target market. It sounded like you were going for sort of that age demographic, I can't remember, 16 to 22 or something. Yeah. Um, and um, I would have thought that actually society would be pretty comfortable with like an 18-year-old not knowing their purpose, like that would be fine, whereas like a 30 to 40-year-old not knowing their purpose, which I would also assume is probably a pretty big market for you as well, um, would would be less acceptable, let's say, or more of a problem. Um, so I'm curious why you didn't target sort of that, that older demographic versus sort of the younger demographic where we'd be a little bit okay with them not knowing their purpose yet, so to speak. Yeah, um, so it's a good question, and we we tried to be as general as, as possible in the beginning, but um, we just found that it was easier to Get nail one use case first, and I don't know. This this is just anecdotal, but somebody recently told me that um, people are starting to ask these questions a lot earlier in their life, and it's sort of what we used to consider the midlife crisis, sort of mid forty five, where you're like, oh my god, how did I get myself into this? It's it's starting to, I don't know. It, it seems to be a general awareness around these questions that is just making these questions surface earlier in life and based on that this is a point where we can intervene in mental sorry in wellness issues before they turn into uh, mental health problems it just seems like that's that is the best inflection point coupled with people's uh, young people's propensity to um, play with bots is higher than that of sort of the mid, uh, middle-aged people. So th yeah, that's, that's what made us determine that age range. All right, last question. Uh, I think we've got quite a few hands. Uh, all right, we'll, we'll, go, we'll, we'll go over there. Uh, Nils, you're gonna come to the pub afterwards, aren't you? Yep. All right, so anyone that doesn't get a chance to answer, ask their question now, come to the pub. <laughs> I'm buying, I'm buying us a drink. Yeah. Yes. It, it's a quick question. Uh, so most of the app stores, uh, you know, that discovery process is also quite difficult. You have tons of apps and people retain probably 10 apps that they use. So I wanted to understand your logic from going from Facebook, Messenger. So help me understand the funnel of what you've seen, uh, how people end up in Facebook Messenger versus irrational for going the other way around. Uh, because you think you already have an install base in Facebook. Uh, so how, how, how do people discover your product? Yeah, so at the moment it's really just organically people um, finding us through Facebook Messenger search. Um, and that, I've just, so it's just an empirical hunch that what we've what we've been told um, is not quite there yet. So uh, yes, we've all got these messenger applications on our phone, but um, and how many people? Let's see, how many people actually talk to a bot regularly through a messenger application on their phone? Two. Awesome. Okay, how many people have a standalone app? that they talk to regular, something like Siri, Google Now, Alexa. Yeah, there you go. It's, a, it's still very difficult to, I mean, most people don't really, most people outside of our community don't really understand the concept of talking to a bot. 
But the concept of downloading apps and interacting with them is just, it's just a lot easier to explain. And that's, that's a hunch that we're following. Awesome, thank you very much.